Good afternoon, everybody. Volume's okay in the back? All right. How about, how about for me? Also good? All right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my name's Witt. Uh, it's my colleague, Sam. Uh, we work in the professional services group at Esri. So we work with organizations like yours to help design systems, implement them, troubleshoot them, things like that. Um, and we're lucky to be on the team, which is really a cross-company thing. This isn't just a services thing or a product thing or a business development thing. We have a, like a cross-functional team at Esri that have been working on this new well-architected framework we're excited to introduce to you guys today. Um, we just spent a lot of time actually just in the website showing you what's there, um, a little bit on how you can maybe apply it to your work, and then also where we're planning to head with it, because it is brand new. Uh, it was released in December, um, and there's really two things. There's the well-architected framework and then the Architecture Center website. You can think of the Architecture Center website as the home of the framework. Um, it's publicly available at architecture.arcgis.com. It was released in December of last year, and we've made a few updates between December and now. Um, it's a little different in terms of the type of resource we've made available at Esri. I think we do a lot of work to focus on helping the users of the GIS. This is really intended to help the people that operate the GIS or build and operate the GIS. Um, and so, that means also speaking IT before we start speaking GIS. Uh, many of you who have been with Esri a long time probably adopted the language of GIS. You know, we say things like geodatabase, like everybody knows what we're talking about, but folks in IT need to know that it's actually just an information model that can live in a relational database or on a file system. And so we've tried to, as much as we can, lean into that kind of IT first language so that this is approachable to a more like traditional IT audience. Um, we do, of course, also hope that our GIS users and administrators and such read it. Um, so in addition to teaching IT a little bit about GIS and ArcGIS, maybe those of you that are working more in the GIS field can learn a little bit of IT and hopefully facilitate those conversations and working relationships between GIS and IT within your organizations. Because what we found when it comes to really delivering systems or enterprise systems, GIS reaching your entire organization, um, having that strong working relationship between GIS and IT supporting the business like really makes a difference. Um, there's four main components uh, listed here. I won't talk about them now because that's where we're going to spend a majority of the time today is actually going through these four components. Um, maybe the last thing to say is the intent of this is to span a level of detail from high level concepts that are maybe appropriate to introduce somebody even at a CIO level to some of these concepts and then to progressively drill into more specific technical details. I would say our initial launch um, is focused a bit more on the concept side of things to help provide introductory material. And we're going to keep going deeper and deeper, helping to connect this to the product documentation. It's also worth noting that this is not intended to replace anything. So wherever possible, we're linking you into the product documentation. We're not going to try to replace that. It's really about making better decisions, informed decisions, as you design your system and work to the product documentation that tells you about all the knobs and switches and, and such that you can turn in the product. So just to go like a little bit into the scope and structure, and we'll use this kind of as our table of contents for diving into the website. Um, there are these four main parts that fall roughly on this level of spectrum, level of detail spectrum from general to specific. The first section over on the left is what we call the ArcGIS overview, which is really a top-down, holistic look at ArcGIS as a system and as a technology platform that you can use to build the business and IT systems for your organization. Resisting the temptation to jump straight into products or capabilities, which is how we traditionally introduce ArcGIS at a high level, really looking at it through the lens of technology and as a system. So let's just dump, uh, jump in right now and take a little bit of a look. So again, this is the, uh, this is the homepage. Um, there's a lot on here. We'll, co we'll come back to the homepage in a little bit. But the first thing I just want to show is up at the top, you'll see the navigation bar has the four sections. 
that, we, that um, mentioned just uh, previously on the last slide. We're going to dive first into the overview. I'm going to use some tabs here just because the internet's been a little, little flaky, although I guess we're on your, your hotspot now. So this is, um, this is an overview. Um, one thing I think it is interesting is this idea of systems. We sometimes talk about ArcGIS as a system or you know, GIS as a system, and in, in many cases it is. Some of your organizations will deploy a singular sort of ArcGIS-based system that's doing everything for your organization. And that's, that's a very valid way of thinking about ArcGIS in your organization as a system. We do, however, see increasingly organizations deploying a collection of more focused GIS systems. So instead of there being a one multifunctional GIS, there's a data editing and management system for managing parcels. There's an imagery data management system for managing imagery. And maybe there's a separate system that's public facing for engaging citizens. And another one for doing big data analytics. And these are sort of deployed and managed as separate systems, but they're interconnected uh, and work together to support the organization at large through all the different types of work that your organization does. The third one is, is a little bit different, and it's the idea of saying, well, we have an enterprise asset management system or uh, a CRM, like a customer relationship management system. We just we need to enable that with a little bit of GIS. So we're taking existing enterprise information systems and injecting specific capabilities from ArcGIS into it. We think about that a little bit differently. Um, this uh, overview also, you know, it covers some things at a high level that are probably review for most folks, like capabilities. We do talk about products and how those align with different deployment options. One thing that I think is new and interesting is this idea of the underlying architecture of ArcGIS. So what we're trying to do here is help somebody that's brand new to the system understand, again, through kind of an IT lens, how ArcGIS works. Like, what does it contain and how do those components and capabilities kind of line up with like a more familiar three-tier architecture view that those of you in IT are probably familiar with. So we have applications looking at web applications and associated builders, mobile and desktop applications, as well as you know, extended reality and immersive experiences using game engines that we saw this morning, all built on our SDKs. At the services tier, we've grouped these into four different areas. We have data services, visualization services, and analysis services. These are kind of like capabilities, if you will, um, just organized in such a way that you can kind of think about them in easy to wrap your head around terms. And then the portal, which I think is a pretty unique thing that we have within ArcGIS as compared to other information systems, is what helps connect users and applications with the functionality and the data sort of sitting behind. Um, it's these portal services, I think, that really enable um, portability and reuse of content across applications. And it also starts to democratize access to content creators. So you don't have to necessarily be a developer or a GIS expert to bring together two data sets and see the relationship. And lastly, we have data. And data is made up of a few different uh, components. We have data stores, which is where the data actually resides. And we support file and object stores, relational databases, cloud data warehouses, as well as NoSQL stores. Um, you store different things in different places. Um, uh, but on top of these, we also make available different information models so that you can do more with this data. Sort of there's this core set of ArcGIS data model and rules, things like features, um, integration with time, 3D, knowledge graphs, what many of you may know as the geodatabase, we can think of as this core ArcGIS set of information models. And then we make available industry-specific data models that kind of sit on top, things like utility network, um, transportation uh, with linear referencing, um, and land management with things like parcels. We also have feeds, which is part of the data story, works a little bit differently. You know, these are real-time feeds coming into the system as well. So this is maybe a new way of thinking about ArcGIS at a top level that doesn't really get into products, but hopefully helps somebody that's brand new understand the capabilities, as well as how those line up sort of architecturally 
with, a, with kind of an IT view. The second section I want to talk about here is system patterns. System patterns is kind of a new idea. And what these are are really common types of systems that we see your organizations building with ArcGIS. Um, they're not actual systems, they're, like, they're abstractions. And in, in being abstractions, they're also not specific to any one industry. But by encapsulating you know, common workflows and capabilities into these different system types, we're able to get more specific about how one might secure a system or make that system more reliable or more performant. Because the way that a self-service mapping system works is very different from a big data analytics system. And so by kind of segmenting them a little bit, we can start to get more specific. We'll just take a look at one of them as an example. I think we'll go into data editing and management. Data editing and management is a type of system that many of your organizations may use for different purposes. It could be kind of a, a heavy, like utility network based editing system with lots of rules and topology and complexities. Or it could be something a little bit simpler, maybe even where you're crowdsourcing data through like ArcGIS Online and Hub, something like that. The patterns are introduced at a conceptual level. So we don't really talk about enterprise or SaaS or products too much here. We try to introduce the types of personas that use this system and their workflows, the different types of applications that are typically um, used. We do start to go deeper into the capabilities. Typically when we talk about capabilities, we talk about things like um, 3D and real time. Here we're getting more specific. So in a data editing and management system, we're differentiating short transaction management from long transaction management. That becomes very important as we start to compare how one might build this system on ArcGIS Enterprise versus ArcGIS Online. But we'll get to that in just a minute. We also start to get into architectural considerations. So how does like data play in this type of system? You know, how do the services used are used in this type of system. Like we're not really doing much analysis here, but there's obviously heavy use of data and visualization. Again, we're still at kind of a conceptual level. Uh, and then we can get into some you know, examples as well as related system patterns. This is a, an idea I wanna come back to in a minute because in a lot of cases, your systems are maybe more complex than just one of these. Um, the example we'll look at at the end with a reference architecture is a data editing and management system, but in a lot of cases, you may do that in combination with offline editing. We've created two separate system patterns for that, but you can actually combine related system patterns, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Once we uh, kind of look at the overview, we have this, uh, each pattern has this page here that talks about how to select deployment patterns for that system pattern. Um, you can do data editing and management with any one of these four, software as a service, platform as a service, Windows and Linux, and Kubernetes. So we actually compare those same capabilities we looked at on the overview. Now we can sort of see how those map to different deployment options, which is really important. This is something I'm pretty excited about because I don't think we've done something like this before. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, you know, is something in Windows and Linux and Kubernetes, or is it just in Windows and Linux, or what do you get with enterprise that you don't get with online? This should help you in the context of specific system patterns understand that, well, short transaction management we can do in ArcGIS Online, but long transactions, which is really what requires versioning in order to manage long transactions, is really only possible if you move to enterprise on Windows and Linux or Kubernetes. You can also dive deeper into each one of these. So if we look, for example, this is a data editing and management system on Windows and Linux. We have these like base architecture diagrams. So you can kind of see if you're implementing the base kind of capabilities for data editing and management, this is, these are the software components that tend to make this up and here's how they interact with each other. So you can see the components of ArcGIS Enterprise with, um, ArcGIS server, we have two different ArcGIS server sites here working with an enterprise portal and then connecting both to a ArcGIS relational data store as well as a um, enterprise geodatabase running within a database management system. 
Yeah, and this is kind of like the typical base data editing and management system. But in a lot of cases, there's extended capabilities you may want. So we do kind of go into, there's these base capabilities, but if you want to do more, like advanced data validation, workflow management, you know, utility network, and some of the industry-specific data models, you can read about them in the extended capabilities. But those aren't shown visually yet in the diagram. The diagram is just the base. These also go into design considerations, which are organized around some of these topics that Sam's going to touch on in just a minute. Things like reliability, security, performance and scalability, and such. So this way, when you're you know, designing or planning a data editing and management system, and you're thinking, well, what are the types of things I should plan on automating? It tells you a little bit about what some of the common things are, right? It's not definitive. It's not, you really must do these things. It's like, most people that build these successful systems are also doing these things. These are things you should look about and think about. And then we, we try to take you into the product documentation where possible, where you can learn more. Some of these system patterns and their deployment options are a little bit different. Um, this is a big data analytics system pattern. If you're familiar with GeoAnalytics Engine, it's a piece of technology that allows you to do distributed geospatial analysis on um, different types of data that runs within Apache Spark. Apache Spark is a, a framework for doing distributed compute on large machines. You can run it on your own infrastructure or in cloud providers. And just to give you a sense, like this diagram looks completely different because the ArcGIS piece is actually running within an Apache Spark container. So I'd encourage you to get in and check out the different system patterns. There's eight of them, and each of them have between two and four different deployment options available. Uh, one last point before I turn it over to Sam is um, this is an area where we're we've started to get into and are excited to do more this year is understanding how to use these system patterns in designing your own system. What I mean by that is in some cases you may just have a single system pattern used to create a system and that's reasonably clear. But then sometimes you may have, um, like you need capabilities from multiple system patterns to actually realize your system. Do you deploy two separate systems and integrate them? Or do you actually compose a single system by combining those two system patterns into one? There's not an easy answer to that, but it will depend on things like non-functional requirements and SLAs. If you have one system that has a 99.9% .9 availability requirement and you have another one that has none of that and is used for long-running batch analytics jobs, chances are those aren't going to be great at the, as the same system. Likewise, you may already have a system deployed that does big data analytics, and so you're kind of building new capabilities on. Do you build those capabilities on that existing system, or do you deploy a new system? We've started to talk about that a little bit here, and that's something we're going to be working on over the next couple months to continue to elaborate on. Just to come back to the slides, System patterns was the second part, and you can see a few examples there. Now we'll move on to the architecture practices. All right, thanks, Whit. I had a couple of comments I was gonna just add on the patterns that, as you talked about that, I think, first of all, you know, those, those eight patterns that he shared are each individually worth diving into. Like he said, they have their own considerations, their own details. And as we prepared those, we worked really closely with our industry specialists who work in those industries to make sure we're getting it right. So make sure this makes sense to what they're doing and their own markets. And the way we separated them was to think about, are they different architecturally enough that they should be considered differently in the design process? And can they be independent of each other enough to be understood on their own? And we're not done there either. I think we want to look at building more of those patterns. If there's others out there that you think we're missing, we'd love to hear that feedback. But we felt that those eight were really the best ones to launch with and uh, start building on. The third part of the site that we spent time uh, putting together for the launch is the architecture practices section. Our background is for both of us as architects, so we do this work daily with our customers and with our partners. And we originally started this idea in some ways to because to, we wanted to have a place we could put resources information that we thought was useful in our practice that we could share with all of you publicly and make available for others in the same role. 
And this site, I think, this section of the site represents the core of that idea. And so I'll dive right into demonstrating that uh, on the web page. It starts on the top with a few other topics. And we've kind of broken this up into a few areas. The first is this idea of architecture pillars. You see six boxes here that each have a nice one or couple word title. This is a similar way of organizing the considerations and recommendations for architecture as we see other organizations doing. So if you're familiar with the Amazon architecture, architecture framework or Azure's site for this or work with IBM or Oracle, others have thought about this same approach of kind of coordinating recommendations and feedback and ideas into different categories. And so as we pull together our list of all the different things we wanted to write about and talk about and inform people about, we use the same approach of saying, what are these kind of core areas that should be considered during the design process as well as throughout the life cycle of a system. And so each of these six areas has their own section in the page, along with a couple sections that look at really the process and the other decisions around design that, that maybe predate those areas. The architectural foundation section talks about, first of all, how to approach the design process. So how to think about, in our opinion, the right way to approach designing one of these systems by involving the business, focusing on workflows, following a very careful methodology, and then things like designing for flexibility in the long term so that you can make changes and evolve the system as your requirements change. Also in here, we have dedicated pages on some pretty interesting topics. This is one I think most people are interested in that we call choosing architecture components. How do you choose between online enterprise, PaaS, and hybrid systems? We've all talked about that, I think, in our design process. You talked to our staff about that in the showcase. This is a page that begins to get into some of the key things that might be a benefit of using online and some things that might be a key benefit of enterprise, as well as platform and our PaaS offerings. This is information that we felt we wanted to pull together from all the various sources at Esri and put into one place, because really architects are the, are the people that are looking at this and making choices around these decision areas, and this is an a way to bring it all together and hopefully make it useful for you. That gets also into things like, how would I choose a database provider? How should I store data? These are not you know, deep, uh, very restrictive, very specific recommendations. It's more areas of how to think about this or how maybe we think about this and how you might learn from our experience in doing that. Environment isolation is an example of a topic that gets into a very foundational decision you make during the design process. Should I have a dev, staging, QA, production, pre-production environment, all these different things, that's a really important decision that has impact on how hard it'll be for you to build the system, how hard it is to manage, and how successful you are with your users, this topic gets into some recommendations around that and maybe a presentation of how we think about that from an Esri perspective. We've also brought things that are not just ArcGIS Enterprise specific. We talk about VDI with ArcGIS Pro, the different constraints we have in secure environments, even very focused technical topics like forward proxies, which may seem very in the weeds, but in many environments can be the difference between success and failure if it's not considered upfront in the design process. Those are a few topics in that kind of foundation section. We, the, sec the second area is called architecting for success. This really focuses more on the people and process side of design. So there's lots of technology topics and decisions you make around virtualization and servers and storage. But how do you think about the team you construct and the processes that you build around your system and how they support the success of that system? So things like change management, which may be more of a people and a more um, kind of interpersonal topic than a more technical one, can have a huge impact on the success of a system. These are all topics that were originally covered in a popular PDF that we had out there called Architecting the ArcGIS System. This is a long running white paper that Esri had for many years. If you go to that link, you'll now see that it redirects to this page. We've moved all that content into this page and modernized it and added to it in these areas. So there are a lot of important topics here that may be um, come up during the design process that you want to cover. If you previously referred to that PDF, they're all going to be available here. And, and uh, have been updated and expanded upon, like I said. Beneath that is these six areas uh, of the pillars. And so the six pillars we, we focused er into uh, are based on our experience, again, of the categories of questions that we might ask during design, the concerns people bring up, the requirements that we see. A lot of these are more non-functional requirements. And in each of these areas, we dive into a number of different topics that relate to the software. In automation, we, and you'll see some great demonstrations of this tomorrow in the, uh, in the plenary. We have a lot of different ways that we use automation in ArcGIS. It can mean many different things. And so first we break it down into what does automation mean, both from a software perspective, but also for workflows 
or automation of infrastructure and deployment and terms like DevOps. Many of you may be working in a DevOps-centric environment or building other applications that use DevOps as an approach. How does ArcGIS fit into that? Well, there's a pretty nuanced way to think about that because ArcGIS is not a single custom application you can redeploy every two hours in a traditional CICD mindset. Well, before this site existed, where, where did we say that, right? You might know that because you've experienced it, but where can we articulate that ArcGIS is a very stateful, complex system that is in some ways less compatible with a CICD process? This is an explanation of that that you can use both to maybe learn more about that yourself, but also present that back to other team members who might be pushing you on that requirement. IAC is also an area we see a lot of interest in, and this begins to break down the differences between infrastructure automation and software deployment automation, and how those two play together and the various tools that we build in that area. Integration is a common requirement for many enterprise systems because they're often working with other enterprise systems. There's often some existing system in place for managing some type of data. How you integrate that can take a thousand different forms and can be incredibly complex if it's not planned for properly. One topic we present here is this idea of different approaches to integration and different methods of, of doing so. There's kind of three examples I talk about in this. There's the idea of bringing external data or tools into ArcGIS. This is the you know what might have been an ETL at one point, but now we have many other options for doing that. They're web services and dynamic layers. You can do that in web maps. You can do that in ArcGIS Pro. You can do that with different databases and different sources. In this case, you're bringing that external system into your GIS to either do a mashup and view it, or maybe do some analysis on top of that. A second approach to integrate might be how to make your ArcGIS managed data and your geospatial system of record available in a different system. That's kind of the inverse to that first example. How do they get your data through a REST API into a Salesforce interface or into a Power BI dashboard they've already built somewhere else? The third pattern then is thinking about integrating in the data or workflow perspective. So how do we use our apps or a collection of systems to integrate various different enterprise systems together in a way that achieves quality and efficiency for that data? It's just an example of kind of presenting some ways to think about this topic in a design process. Again, not to say these are the only options or these are the best options, but I think helpful information to guide that discussion. And then in this section, we get into the details of some other technologies that we're beginning to see a lot of demand around within Esri. So a few years ago, I began to get questions about this technology called API management. Anybody using API management or having requirements for that? Maybe a few people. So API management is a, a, a new thing that we're seeing pushed by cloud vendors and other companies that basically is a way to wrap all your APIs in a single layer where you can control authentication, do metering, do reverse proxy controls, all that kind of stuff. And you can see some of the vendors here uh, that are listed. We were seeing demand on this and we really didn't know how to think about that and talk about it with our customers. Now, if you see some questions about that or you wanna learn about that, here's a page that talks about how Esri understands API management, what's the definition from our perspective, and how it is or isn't compatible with different parts of our software with some recommendations. So for example, you know what we've learned is that it's most compatible with standalone ArcGIS server. That's an important detail for that integration pattern. There's other things in here and lots of details you can get into, but these topics under the integration section are a little bit opinionated in saying, well, data lakes and data warehouses is only like a trillion dollar industry topic, right? How can we say something concise about that? We can discuss how Esri has approached data lakes as an analytical data source and data warehouses as an analytical database source and then how that manifests in our software in various ways through ArcGIS Pro, through services, and all those integrations. And so if you're getting requests in a new system design to integrate a data warehouse or system like that with your GIS, you can use these pages to help identify maybe some common patterns that can be successful or some areas to stay away from that are gonna be a bit tougher to achieve. Observability is a topic that is uh, a little bit lighter here. You see just a few articles, but something that we're seeing a lot of demand around, which is that enterprise systems should be observable to the outside uh, users of that system, as well as the administrators of that. One change for GIS systems in the past five or 10 years has been a trend away from just being managed by a GIS team, where they're the ones who deploy, configure, manage, and troubleshoot that system, into needing support from the IT professionals that support them from the business. That means that those IT groups have to be able to understand, is the system running properly? 
What does it mean to be working or not working? When users complain about performance or issues, how can I monitor and get an idea of what's happening in that system? These topics are of great interest to us because we've begun to add more and more observability targets to the software. We also have built tools like ArcGIS Monitor that can be used to monitor system performance. And these uh, two topics in here begin to give some ideas of an approach to looking at both the monitoring of performance, but also this idea of defining and capturing telemetry for systems. Telemetry is an idea that really comes from the web app world where you can kind of monitor user activity and see which buttons they're clicking and how they interact with pages. And in a GIS, this is a way to say for workflows that users are going through, how can we monitor how successful they are, how efficient those workflows are, the performance of the system under load in those scenarios, and how can we use that information to guide either adjustments, improvements, or fixes to that system if there are problems. So observability is something that comes up a lot in cloud deployments, but we think it's equally important whether you're on-prem or in the cloud, and it also is relevant whether you're using SaaS, platform as a service, or software. A big focus of design in most systems is around performance and how we scale those systems. This is a very deep topic that Esri has worked in for a long time. Uh, you may have pre in the past worked with our system design teams on doing uh, capacity-based scaling assessments or estimating the sizing of servers to understand how you might support a 100 user load or a 1,000 users in a certain workflow. This section begins to, I think, present a modern view of some of those topics around, first of all, how to think about performance and set baselines, how to design a testing strategy so you actually can really reliably look at your system, test if it's performing as well as it was last week, last month, or last year, and even some tools we can prepare and share with you guys around uh, performance testing to do that structured work. I'll just pause here also. This is a page I, I spent a lot of time on that I like quite a bit because it looks at all the different ways you can think about optimizing for performance because there are differences in the different ways you can approach that from optimizing your network and your design from a network perspective, looking at how apps work with data and how the app itself performs, how individual web service types like image services or map services can be optimized by using, for example, caching strategies or reducing the precision of geometries or all these different ways you can look at optimization. This is one place to bring those things together. And it, as Whit mentioned earlier, we often link back out to our documentation, but we're presenting it all together here as a way to think about this object in a more holistic, or think about this um, area in a more holistic fashion. The reliability pillar gets at a really important topic of availability and reliability. This is often a constraint or a design uh, goal of an enterprise system is to have a high SLA, right? What does a high SLA mean? We talk a bit about what that means to us here. And in the end, that has a massive impact on the design process, on the cost of your system to deploy, but also on the cost to manage that system. And so how we think about reliability and availability is maybe one of the most critical design constraints that we talk about in this section and that leads to properly defining the right level of this for a system. We want to be really clear when we talk about a well-architected system that there's not one definition that, for example, all well-architected systems must be highly available or must have a 99.9% .9 SLA. It's very subjective, and that's one of the challenges we have in creating content, is to give you information to make good choices without being too directive and leading you down a path towards something that isn't going to work for you. Reliability is a great example of that. And in this section, we talk about high availability in depth. We talk about backup approaches, not only ArcGIS software-based backup approaches, but also things like backing up with VM-based strategies or external tools. Different ways you can approach the challenge of a backup and restore process, as well as what does it mean to plan for disaster recovery, and is that really valuable to have in your system, or are you doing a bunch of work that is unnecessary because you'll never make use of that capability? So these topics, again, try to guide you through that decision tree of do I need this or how should I approach this topic? The last section is, is around security, and there's quite a few topics here. Security is something that has evolved a lot and continues to evolve for us and for all of you, I'm sure. And there's topics here that begin to introduce some of those areas, like a really important one around authentication and authorization and the distinguishing between those in an ArcGIS context. We've all worked with authentication for many years. Esri has all these different ways you can do it in the software. Differentiating between authentication models and providers and those ways that we authorize users 
is an important way to control what is or isn't possible in that process. In discussions with you know, business teams giving requirements, they'll often kind of mash things together into saying we want you know, single sign-on and user provisioning from one location. And to tease out what those things mean, you have to get very detailed about the process, the steps, the ideal configuration of that system. These topics begin to give you some terminology that I think will help to go through that process. Security also gets into some topics that may be totally external to the ArcGIS system. A good example of that is MFA or multi-factor authentication. So MFA is a requirement that is almost universally applied to most enterprise identity providers now. These little soft tokens we have or the push notifications or the SMS codes that we get. In most scenarios, this is totally outside of the Esri system. ArcGIS has no idea what this token is. We don't know what the number is. You're being launched to a different identity provider and then using this pattern to further secure that. And we get asked in, in my world quite a bit, how does Esri work with MFA? And here's an answer to that, which is to give a really good overview of what that might mean and how that works in an ArcGIS system, as well as some considerations for that. You know, for example, that we use an OAuth-based login process to manage user sessions, and that that's usually applied during that part of the st that, that that step of the process. So ArcGIS is never aware of that, or that MFA can be really challenging if you use headless requests or have a scripted process to connect things. It can really interrupt your system, and so we try to in each of these topics present the kind of the overview of what it means, how Esri's approached that, and then a few recommendations from our design practice of how to think about those topics. That's the last of the six pillars. They're all kind of grouped together in this area. And uh, really interested in also your feedback throughout this on, on other topics you should, you'd like to see there. We're going to keep expanding on these and adding to them. We have a list of, I don't know, 50 or 60 more topics to add over time. This is really the first, the first launch of it. But that's really the sum of the architecture practices section uh, of the site. The last and fourth area is the architecture library. This I won't spend as much time talking about, but you can recognize that there are a lot of pieces of content that either uh, would be of interest to architects or maybe are examples that are very specific to a certain scenario that may be valuable to others but aren't really a fit for this kind of fairly well-defined system patterns and pillars kind of structure. So if you think of that as the framework, the patterns and pillars, the library is a place where we've gathered together a lot of content from both Esri and external sources that are things like blog posts and technical papers or case studies. And these are items that we think are really relevant that you can filter based on different content types. You can see a list of those here. And this is where we'll begin to see things like industry-specific design examples or a lens for a certain industry or customer type as to how they might think about a certain topic. Sometimes there's people who've been successful in an example deployment, and we're not really sure if that can be uh, you know, repeated by every single customer or every single environment, but we still want to show what's possible. This is, library is a place you might put that. And so there's a few things here that are new and are released from last week. A couple blog posts, this great case study from Esri Saudi Arabia, looking at how they deployed a GCP deployment of Kubernetes. Nice deep dive into some of the choices they made, the challenges they had, their success in that area. These are things you could find elsewhere, but we've really brought them all together for searchability and access. Uh, in the library. This is also where we'll begin to solicit content from the other parts of Esri that are either doing architecture work or doing work in solution engineering or building examples or doing case studies and performance baselines. They'll all be submitting into this. And so I think there's you know just under 100 topics right now, and we've been iterating on adding more of these each time we do a small release. I'll just show one example that we can talk about in a little more detail that's brand new as of last week, which is this reference architecture. We've had a lot of requests since we first launched the site to get more specific about design. Whit mentioned that we try to start off really conceptual and get things right at a high level, and then we're going to kind of keep working into more detail. Some of the first feedback was, we want processor cores. We want disk storage. We want RAM numbers, right? No surprise there. So why don't we, ha why don't we have that in this? Well, part of it is because that's extremely subjective, and we're being careful to make good choices. We're trying to walk our way towards that by getting more and more detailed with each release. And so in this last week's update, we released our first, what we're calling a reference architecture, in this case for a utility network management system that begins to build on, you'll see the data editing and management system referenced here, builds in system patterns and begins to fix a few more elements of the design. So in this case, it's saying this is a uh, data editing management system at its base. 
it's built on Windows or Linux using Arches Enterprise. So this example is specific to that deployment pattern. It adds some more capabilities, it focuses in on a few and maybe ignores other capabilities. And then it goes into the workflows you might use the system for. So we've designed this reference architecture for a few specific workflows around utilities. We also present a more detailed diagram of how you might compose that system out of different product components in this case. You begin to see some logical type diagramming here. It gets into more detail about networking, a little more detail about how things are separated and how they're hosted differently. Not showing anything you know, specific about it's this Amazon instance size or this you know, storage or this gigabit you know, switch as a network constraint. That's not really the role of this, but it's getting into more detail than we had before. And then also I think importantly, it goes into some of the design choices that were made in these six architecture pillar areas in building this reference design. So what were some of the things that we considered and then chose that led to that design? This goes through each of those areas and talks a bit about that. It also gives some guidance on how you might use this to support your own design process. So this is available through the library. It's an example of an area that I think we'll be building on throughout the year to hopefully introduce more and more of these reference designs and then continue to build even more detail beneath that. All right, back to PowerPoint for just a minute. Cover the practices and the library, all the things that are in there. This represents the core of the site, and it does not exist alone as its own standalone site. Of course, it's its own website, but it exists in the context of all of Esri. And so importantly, this is really a bridge between some of our content on Esri.com, which is more focused on capabilities, products, the marketing of what's available in the product side. And then all the way to the right, you see our documentation pages, which I think are truly amazing in the level of depth they provide, the level of help they provide to users who really know our system. But if you're trying to make the, the leap from what you want into how you, how you do that, it's a pretty big gap right now. And this site is intended to fill some of that space and fit into that kind of spectrum we showed earlier really smoothly. And so it's very well connected, I think, to each of those sides. And we're looking at ways in the future to better integrate that with links and kind of being able to move up and down that spectrum a little bit. In terms of our plans going forward, uh, as I mentioned, we did our first launch in December. This effort started really around this time last year, and so we worked through most of the calendar year last year to build consensus, gather all the inputs from our various teams. And into this year, we're excited to keep building on this and iterating rapidly as much as we can. We did a small release uh, just a few weeks ago. We have another one planned before a few conferences in April and a bigger release plan for the user conference in June. We're gonna eventually you know, keep doing this at some steady cadence. What we are trying to do is stay aligned to how the product releases change, stay aligned by adding more and more content to the library and making sure that we're staying modern with our responses on certain technologies or changing things if they become unsupported or not recommended. And so we hope to continue to improve this Really, the primary way we're gonna do that is that we want to evolve the content based on your feedback. So it's great that you're all here today. We really would like you to give us feedback on the page and on every single part of the website, if you look on in these individual pages, you'll see a tell us what you think link on the bottom. And these links, just like our developers page, go straight to Wit and our team. They go into our GitHub as issues and we tackle them that next day with a response as to what we're gonna do. So I think you'll see in our release notes, which you can see in the overview, under the About section, we give an update on what we've been resolving based on user feedback and making changes to. We want to be very responsive to what your input is. And so that's to say that as we evolve this, we want to be really looking at the feedback and demand that's out there and adding more information based on that. We want to continue to align with the updates, like I said, get more work together to kind of uh, knit together Esri.com, ArcGIS.com, and then also be looking at new things and new technologies that are, that are out there. We don't have a lot of content in this site around AI and machine learning, for example. That's obviously an area of a lot of focus for Esri. We need to think about how we're going to talk about that from an architectural sense for our users. And then future updates will include you know, more reference architectures in the future, uh, getting into more logical and physical design guidance, and then things like I mentioned around industry lenses and even potentially some diagramming tools that we can share out for all of you to use to build diagrams that are similar to these if they're of interest, or you can ignore them if you don't want them, but that we think will help people build a similar language in terms of how they do their design for ArcGIS. That's a bit on roadmap, and then I would just say, uh, 
opportunities to connect with us. Whit and I are both here all week. We also have a lot of colleagues in the showcase that have been involved in this. We do have a second workshop around this topic that is more detailed on how to use this framework in the design process. This gave a big kind of survey overview. That would be a great follow on if you're interested in learning more about this. We'll talk about how to apply those pillars to a really structured design process and how to make some of those choices and ask some of those key questions in the process. That's on Thursday uh, over in Renaissance at the San Jacinto room. And then, like I said, we're going to be in the showcase um, in the ArcGIS Enterprise and online areas. There are colleagues who are familiar with this. Um, this is not an enterprise only topic, though there's, of course, a lot of enterprise specific discussions. And we're really interested in what you think, uh, you know, critical, positive, all along the spectrum. Really want to hear that. So that'd be very welcome. And I think I'll end there. We have some feedback requests here. Would love to take some questions from you guys. We have a mic up here, or you can shout them out unless you want to add anything else that I missed. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the things we are, so uh, uh, thank you, and the, the system, yeah, we do some of it, not enough, probably yet. So just to maybe highlight some of the things you were touching on, in the system patterns, if we take, for example, like imagery data management and look at the overview, um, we look at this kind of through the lens of user personas and workflows. This talks like at a high level, What's the like, business value that organizations tend to get from an imagery data management system? So we kind of enumerate some of those at a high level. And then we kind of get into the different types of personas that would work with that system and the workflows that they would be performing. Still pretty high level. This is about as deep as we go there. But if we had business requirements, we could go directly to each pattern and then uh, run you, you could, yeah. One thing I think we, we, we do intend to work on this year is to provide a better way of sort of like comparing the system patterns at a glance. Right now, you do kind of have to, well, we have like this top level page that does a little bit of that. You know, it like describes each of them, but we're, we're thinking through how best to create like visuals or even infographics or like a poster or something, you know, they like can compare at a glance the different system patterns. Business, um, needs and business value will be one of those lenses. Um, along with, you know, more detailed capabilities, that's sort of another way of looking at it. If I come back in here, like what capabilities does it offer? This is getting a little bit more into the technical language than the business language. Um, so I do think there's more room to articulate the business requirements associated with system patterns. But that is also, as you pointed out, where we do want to get into more detail with reference architectures. Um, so I think, I think this will allow us to get even more specific with how a given system example fulfills certain business needs. But I, I would just add that you, know, you asked about business analysts and like a BA role in, in a design process. I think that's pretty revolutionary for GIS systems to think that way. And part of what we're trying to do is position the process of designing a GIS system as being no different from other IT systems where that's a requirement, that you have full-time BAs that do workflow assessment. 
in my 15 years of doing design at Esri, we've never employed BAs in, in my team or our teams. It just hasn't been treated the same way. And I think we're trying to invert that and say that it's more important to invest time in what the actual workflows are than we haven't than, than people have thought in the past. Because they used to think, oh, it's just about choosing the right size of server and how many servers you need and we're good to go because it has all these capabilities. And so I think that's part of the argument we're making is to treat these JS systems more like a real traditional IT system and invest that time up front because it's going to pay off in better design choices and in a more uh, system that better aligns to what the expectation of the business is rather than just a general capability system that can do a lot of things, but nobody's that happy with it, which is what we get a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. One other thought that comes to mind is, you know, I think at Esri, we've historically looked, at least large portions of us at Esri have looked at um, how you use our software through the lens of products and capabilities. But there is an increasing movement, if you will, within Esri to look at, um, look at the use of GIS through systems. This is like one manifestation of that. But our industry teams, which include both like account managers and business development types, as well as services, professional, like those of us that are kind of customer facing and know specific industries, they're going through and starting to document like what are the most common types of systems that the GIS fulfills within my industry. And then I think that will help tease out business value, business needs it satisfies. And eventually we'll start building reference architectures to kind of describe those. But um, it's not something we've been, like as you said, like great at at Esri or GIS in general necessarily thinking about things through more traditional systems, but that is starting to change. So I think you'll see more of that here, but also sort of permeating all of your interactions with Esri people and uh, documentation. So it'll take some time, but sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And workflow is part of that. But uh, are you thinking of a design pattern, as somebody else mentioned earlier, there's a lot of the staff here coming into designing this thing. The customer will bring certain things to the table and say, well, I have this legacy system. And, and we're talking about an overall IT infrastructure. So sometimes you don't just have a GIS infrastructure. You've got existing HR and financial systems and workflow systems. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say at the moment, the system patterns are mostly articulating pretty GIS-centric types of systems. But even those types of systems, as you point out, often, and as Sam talked about it, often need to integrate with other things to really fulfill the business need. What we have right now is if we just dig in, for example, to like data editing and management, um, and we pick one of these systems, like let's look at it on Kubernetes, for example, under considerations, these are organized by the pillars, and one of those pillars is integration. So we talk about how data editing management systems are commonly required to integrate with enterprise asset management systems specifically, like that's a use case. But we don't really go deeper than that yet. If you go over into the integration pillar, you can learn about general ways that you can integrate with different systems. Where we haven't yet gone is at a level of detail that says if you're building a data editing and management system and integrating it with an asset management system, this is how that would look. Or here's the two or three different specific patterns for that specific integration of systems um, you know, like that, that tend to work well. So I think that's that level of detail we'll continue to get into throughout the year. But maybe in the library, you can have an example. Yeah. And I think that's, um, so we'll make a note of that, but this is also, there's like a ton of things we could do. We want to focus on the things that really make a difference. So I would encourage yeah. you to all like get in there and tell us what you think, because we will focus our attention on the things that you all need. Yeah, as, yeah. as we kind of started to de develop this, we quickly realized that any single pattern or any single pillar could have been an entire year of content development. And so we focused on really 
what was the the content that would raise the level of all these discussions so that we could have more detailed discussions about something specific rather than completely plumbing the depths of data identity management in every possible configuration. And so I think that was a subjective choice we made to do that. But the idea is that this gives us all a language to use and some reference materials we can use to have more efficient and more detailed conversations earlier in the design process by using very similar terminology or kind of aligning to that. And ideally, if we're using the same topics and discussions as you are, as our product teams are, as we're seeing on the website, there's a kind of um, synergy to that where we're all kind of using the same constructs to talk about design and that helps us all yeah. be as well as process. the other systems we'd be integrating with so like as you mentioned we tried not to like do anything crazy new here we studied what oracle did and ibm did and salesforce did and google did and amazon did and microsoft did um, they all have architecture centers and most of them have a framework that some of them call it the well-architected framework so part of our idea here is we want the people that are reading those to quickly understand what's going on here and it, for it to be familiar, not different. Um, and so using some of this language, if you need to go over into like SAP's asset management system and learn about integration, it's a little bit easier to make those connections. But yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I think you had hand next. Yeah. yeah first of all, this looks incredible. So awesome work here. Captain. Thanks. Mm. It's a good question. We, we, do, we do try to put blog posts out for the major releases, which has been one of so far. So we're one for one <laughs> in December. Uh, and our, our release last week, we're a little bit rushed to get it in before the conference, so we didn't blog about that. I would think that the blog is a good place to look for that. Um, if you have ideas of how you'd like to be notified beyond that, would be all ears for that. Um, at, Mm. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely look at that. Yeah, yeah, as an example, when we first launched, we sent an email out to all administrators of Esri customers who have deployed enterprise before through my Esri. Right, we had all that information. We don't want to overuse that information because people get you know annoyed by that. But we can definitely look at a way to notify as part of other product updates when we have changes to this. Yeah. And this is fully integrated like organizationally into our marketing team and so they like they know all that stuff. Sam and I don't know, you know, what how to post Twitter updates or, you know, the ArcGIS Enterprise newsletter, but there are a lot of these channels and they are thinking about getting it out through those um, but um, so hopefully you'll see a lot of it in through different channels, but um, if there's specific things you'd like, do let us know. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, did you have a question? It's about um, capacity model and capacity planning and how to estimate the size of the pixel, which is always a concern for IT. Um, not yet. Uh, I would say we started conceptually, we're kind of in the logical space. We haven't really gotten to what you might call like the physical level of architecture planning. That is where we're trying to go this year. Um, soon, um, hopefully in April, we'll release a new type of an artifact, which is like a validated case study where we'll show um, like benchmark data examples and a physical architecture associated with a logical architecture. So you can see at least an example if you're doing this type of system and you're running it on AWS and you're using SQL Server as the database versus SAP HANA, how does the utility network perform? Um, we can't do that, of course, for every type of system out there, but we're going to get some examples out there with the performance benchmark data as validated by our engineering team um, out of Esri. That's not exactly what you're asking, but that is something we, we are working on and should have out soon. Um, we, we do want to help provide more guidance to the physical design process, but I think I would just add, I think where I'd like to start on that is in the system patterns. Because the patterns differ so much in terms of architecturally how they use infrastructure from like a Spark-based system to imagery to an enterprise app hosting is totally different sizing constraints. I think we should begin to add the physical design recommendations to each system pattern to say, in the design process, 
You should think particularly about disk speed in an imagery data management system, if that's the answer. Or think particularly about network throughput for enterprise app hosting. We have an example of that here uh, that is pretty light, right? And so we'd like to, de to, de to deepen that. I think we would like to build in our constructs here rather than have some new page that's called physical design and capacity planning because really that process is so subjective to what kind of system you're building and needs to be informed by workflows, workloads, and then what your constraints are from a design perspective. Yeah. But we do know there's a high demand for that sort of thing, and we're going to try to get there this year. Yeah. yeah. Cool, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how do you have any reference to your legacy architecture, like as an example, geometric network, utility network? What does it mean in the context of this new service or architecture? Are you covering every legacy to the latest ones? Not much. We try, we're trying to promote kind of the new, more modern patterns because this is really about like best practices. But there are some places, I think, where we acknowledge the history and how a new pattern relates to a, a more historic pattern. But it's definitely leaning into the new more than the legacy. I it's guess. probably something we should add to the reference architecture for network management is that those systems are very often replacing a system of a previous vintage. And so understanding what are the kind of key changes architecturally, but also from a workflow perspective in modernizing that approach would be a nice addition to that reference architecture because it's very specific to that industry. Yeah. Yeah. Going, what is this going to yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think we idea. took a very, I mean, we have the luxury of choosing what we want to write about. We took a very optimistic approach to systems, right? And so this is not relevant to your scenario, partially because when you have an existing enterprise system, you've already made a lot of design choices in terms of how it's configured and constructed that are even more important to the eventual design. And so with that kind of branching logic model of how different they could be, it's basically impossible to provide good guidance that would be applicable to every system. And so we need to look back at how we can provide resources that are helpful to that scenario as part of this year's work. I will say, though, having looked at this topic for six years to get where I'm at, thank God you guys put this together. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I don't have to explain it a million times over to my supervisor and whoever yeah. I'm working with. Like, well, yeah. We, we were getting a little tired of explaining it also. <laughs> So we're, yeah, we're the, happy. That my approach was like after the fifth meeting where people were like, can you talk about MFA to my customer? I'd be like, I'm going to write an article about that because I'm tired of talking about it. And this is partially, that's literally one of the reasons we built this was to have a starting point, a five or 10 minute, you know, little kind of initial design of that to then have the better conversation after that, where we at least all understand the basics. Now we can get into details of what it means for you, but I don't want to repeat the basics every time in a different way. And this is now a resource for all of you to do the same. Yeah, in the back. Oh yeah, the yes. So, um, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not even. We sure talked about not using version numbers for that exact reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I we always took those off. That's our internal way of just knowing what release we're talking about. But this is going to be like largely building things um, on. So actually, I, I don't know that we're going to be making historic versions of the website available. That is something we can certainly explore if we start to make significant changes to it. But most of what we anticipate changing over the course of this year are adding. So we may add system patterns, but that's a very deliberate choice that eight patterns isn't going to expand to 15 by the end of the year. Maybe there'll be one or two. We'll definitely be adding pillar topics. We will be evolving them as IT changes, as our capabilities change. And that goes for the system patterns too. We have those like capability matrices that we looked at. You know, as software evolves, something may turn from an empty circle to a full circle because we've now added support for it. That happened just recently when we added geocoding and network analyst support to Geoanalytics Engine, we lit up that capability, um, as well as adding things to the library reference architectures. If we find that like 
like a system pattern needs to be rewritten, like because like fundamentally the design guidance has changed. It, we may need to at that point think about keeping historic versions available, but I, at the moment we're not anticipating major changes to what's there. It's more minor as well as adding and evolving, again, more towards the physical end of the design spectrum. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I, that that would be good. I think it's kind of buried right now. I think yeah. having on the homepage a way to highlight what's new and that there's a new release is an, an easy fix for that. Yeah, yeah, it's a great idea. Thanks. All right. Well, we're happy to take some questions. I have to run to another meeting, but yeah. we can stick around. Again, we have the Thursday session, same time over there. Thank Thanks. you.